Would you open your Bibles to Psalm 137? By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung up our lyres, for there our captors required of us songs. And our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites the day of Jerusalem. How they said, lay it bare, lay it bare down to its foundations. O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed Blessed shall be he who repays you with what you have done to us. Blessed shall be he who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. Why in the world would anybody want to preach this passage? That's the question I've been asking for months now. Because as I began planning this sermon series on learning to deepen our prayer lives through the Psalms, this was actually the very first Psalm that the Lord impressed on my heart. I assumed it was not the Lord, but maybe indigestion. And so I continued to pray and was just heavily impressed to preach Psalm 137. Then I started studying 137 deeply and continued to pray, Lord, are you sure? Why? Why Psalm 137? In fact, when Ronald said, uh, Mike, I notice you're preaching Psalm 137. What kind of songs go with that? He asked about Metallica or Iron Maiden, and I suggested that Dr. Kelly might not be pleased with those selections. So... Uh, we went in a different direction, Dr. Kelly. But let me back up a little bit, because it's been a month or so since I preached the first sermon in this series. And the first sermon was Psalm 8, and I talked about this being a foundational uh, psalm for us and, a, and, a, and, and sort of a foundational way to begin our praying by focusing on the glory of God, beholding His glory, because when we have our minds drenched with visions of the glory of God, everything else comes into perspective rightly. We moved the next sermon into Psalm 67 where we talked about praying that God would bless us for the purpose of His glory being displayed through us and the rest of the world glorifying Him. And now we are at a place where we are on the heels of the consequences of God's people neglecting the glory of God. We have a psalm here that is raw, it is brutal, and let's face it, it's unpleasant. So why do we need to look at Psalm 137? I'll give you three brief reasons why I think we should. Number one, it's in the Bible. It is part of the canon of Scripture, and as part of the canon of Scripture, we need not be afraid of it or teach our people to be afraid of certain parts of the Scripture. I think it's important that we deal with all of it. Secondly, I think we need to look at this so that we can gain a better understanding. Um, we need to understand how to interpret what we call the imprecatory psalms, these psalms of imprecation. In other words, these prayers to God to bring vengeance, to bring justice, and even to bring violence. We need to understand how we're supposed to interpret those because we need to be able to answer questions. I guarantee you that if you have ever encouraged your church members to read through Scripture, they run across these passages and they have these questions and we need to be able to handle those questions. In fact, a lot of times they have these questions and maybe they're afraid to ask. But let me tell you who's not afraid to ask about these kinds of things and that's the skeptics. I don't know if you've read Paul Copan's little book, When God Goes to Starbucks. He addresses several objections to the Christian faith that he sees brought to him on a regular basis in his interactions. And one of those questions is, why are these psalms so often so vindictive? It's a question we need to be able to answer. But a third reason is I think we can learn some things about prayer. I didn't say I think we need to start praying verse 9 against everyone who opposes us. 
But I think that in this psalm, we can learn some things about prayer. And this psalm will actually serve as a transition to the next three sermons in this series. And so we'll dive in. The first thing we'll do is look at the text in its context. That's where we need to be. No matter what we're doing, when we're looking at the Bible, we need to look at the text within its context. Then I'm going to give you some principles for understanding and interpreting the imprecatory psalms, especially with a focus on Psalm 137. And finally, I'll try to answer the question, what can we learn about prayer from Psalm 137? Would you pray with me and pray for me as we dive into this text? Holy Father, uh, we just confess now that uh, we get some angst at times when we face certain portions of your perfect pure, inspired, and inerrant word. God, we believe that it is all good and all for your glory and our good, but sometimes we struggle with it. And I pray that today you would give me a clarity as I preach and that you would give us all a clarity as we seek to understand your word more fully. But God, our prayer is not just that you will make us smarter, but that you will make us more holy. Take your word and use it in the sanctifying process of shaping us into the image of Jesus. We lay ourselves before you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. First, let's consider the text in its context. What is going on here is we know we can date this to sometime during the Babylonian captivity. So this is after 586 B.C. when the Israelites had been taken captive into Babylon. Jerusalem had been laid waste. Their king had been captured and his eyes gouged out. They were in a very hopeless situation. In fact, we can assume, I think safely, that this was shortly after the deportation, shortly after they came into Babylon. Babylon. And here they are, sitting by the waters. Whether this was right by the Euphrates or some of the tributaries that came off, we don't know, doesn't matter. They're sitting by the waters and the, they're grieving the loss of their family. They're grieving the loss of their livelihood. They're grieving everything that has happened to them. And the Babylonians are coming up to them saying, where's your song now? Go ahead, go ahead. You have some great songs you sing about Jerusalem. Let's hear them. Go ahead. Can you imagine being taken captive in another country and your tormentor saying, Sing God bless America for me. Sing America the beautiful for me. Can you imagine being thrown into prison for your Christian faith and your tormentors, your captors being around saying, Go ahead, sing some praise songs. Let's hear how good your God is now. Let's, let's hear some songs about how God rescues you from your trials. Shall we hear some of those? And they're sitting there by the river. They're grieving. They are weeping. And their tormentors come along. And their tormentors are encouraging them to sing. And they say, how can we sing in Babylon? They'd lost their song. You ever been that way where your song was just gone? They'd lost it. What they had not lost, however, is emotion. They had this burst of emotion. This burst of emotion that God would judge the Edomites. Now let's hold on a minute because we have to ask as we're considering context, why, why are they upset about the Edomites? I mean, isn't the Babylonians, isn't it the Babylonians that took them captive? What's going on with the Edomites? Well, let's think about who are the Edomites. The Edomites are descendants of Esau. And who is Esau? Esau is the brother of Jacob and you might remember a nice little phrase that was uttered by God he talked about Jacob I loved but Esau what I hated the older brother was going to serve the younger brother the descendants of Esau hated the descendants of Jacob the Jews they hated them with a passion what they saw is that these people stole cheated their forefather out of the birthright and what all the Jews had was, should belong to them and we know that when the the Jews when Moses led them through the desert and they were going to go in the promised land here sat Edom right on the southern border of the promised land this big this big area that belonged to the Edomites and they said we just want to pass through we're not going to do anything. We're not going to harm you. We're, we're not even going to feed our livestock with your food. Just let us pass through. The Edomites said, no, we hate you. Go away. They actually went all the way around Edom to go in the promised land. There were centuries, literally centuries of animosity between these people. So when the Babylonians came swooping down from the north and they captured Jerusalem and they conquered all of the southern kingdom, some of the Jews started fleeing. Well, where can they go? They don't go north. 
where are they going to go? They're going to go to Edom. Maybe we can go to our long lost cousins. Maybe they can give us shelter. And what did the Edomites do? The Edomites scooped him up. You can read about this in Obadiah. This is the prophecy concerning the Edomites in the book of Obadiah. The Edomites were scooping them up and handing them right over to the Babylonians with glee apparently. Here you go. You can have all our Jewish friends. So yeah, they were a bit out of sorts with the Edomites. And of course we can see why they were out of sorts with the Babylonians and we know that the Babylonians were a cruel people. In Lamentations chapter 5, we read that when the Babylonians conquered the Jews, they raped their women. In 2 Kings chapter 25, as we read about the ones who, who, who will take the little ones and dash them against the rock, we read in 2 Kings chapter 25 about the last days of Jerusalem when King Zedekiah had offended Babylon. And they captured him. And they gave a judgment against him and the judgment was for his children to be murdered and his eyes gouged out we might read that and think they were grown children but zedekiah was 32 years old we don't know how many children he had but he would have had young children and the babylonians killed the little kids in the king's very own house we have reason to believe they would have done that to other people as well. This was common in the days with these invading armies to kill the children. As it's just a cruel act. It's what the Assyrians did when they came into Samaria. We read in Hosea chapter 13 that when the Assyrians came and took the northern kingdom in 722, that the little ones were dashed to pieces and the pregnant women were ripped open. We glean from Nahum chapter 3 that when the Assyrians took Thebes in Africa in 664 B.C., that her infants were dashed in pieces at the head of every street. It is no stretch of the imagination to think of the Jews sitting by the waters, perhaps days or weeks after they had seen their children grabbed out of their arms and smashed to pieces and trampled underfoot. How would you be grieving and weeping under a scenario and then to have your tormentor saying sing some songs smile be joyful it's easy for us to be critics and to give instruction to these ancient jews who should have loved their enemies and they should have prayed for those who persecuted them it's easy when you're not in the situation it's like I met a guy, the only guy I ever met really, who claimed to be a true pacifist. True pacifist. This guy was visiting our next door neighbor. Our children was little. My son was little. He was playing in the backyard. This guy's daughter wandered into our backyard, was swinging on the swing set with our son. And the dad, of course, came looking for her and he wandered into the backyard. And I decided I would strike up a conversation to share the gospel with this guy. And we were talking and he said something about being in the Navy. And I said, oh, you were in the Navy. He said, yeah. I said, well, that's really wonderful. Thank you for serving our country. He said, I don't think our country should even have a military. I said, really? He said, yeah, I don't think we should have police either. I think we should get rid of all guns and that everyone should just love each other. <laughs> Sounds great. Let's all join hands and sing the Coke song, right? And I said, you don't really believe that. He said, yes, I do. I said, no, you don't. I said, I'll prove it to you. What if when you had rounded the corner and opened the gate and come into my backyard and instead of seeing your daughter swinging on the swing set with my son, you had seen somebody raping her? Would you go give him a hug and say, we just all need to get along? And he said, that's a pretty good point because I'd kill him. It's easy to be a pacifist. And it's easy to be a critic when we're not in the middle of something. This is a shocking passage of Scripture to us because of what we know about the New Testament ethic or what we think we do. We have to consider the context, but moreover, let's consider, I'm going to do this very quickly because Dr. Kelly only gave me two and a half hours with you today, okay? But he didn't, I'm teasing. Ten factors for exe, not executing, exegeting. I don't know, I may execute this thing before the day's over. <laughs> Ten factors in exegeting imprecatory psalms. I'm going to do it quickly. 
Number one, consider the ancient Near Eastern context in which this was uttered. Imprecatory prayers were not uncommon for any of the cultures in that day. We have a lot of ancient prayers from the, uh, from the different cultures in that day who prayed these kinds of prayers. Now, we may say they shouldn't have, and we can sit and critique those prayers, but we are in a different culture where when we see these things, it's shocking to us, and we need to realize that in the 6th century B.C., this probably just wasn't as shocking to the people who read this or heard it as it is to us. Number two, psalmists and prophets regularly used hyperbole. In other words, they used over-the-top speech. I'm not necessarily saying this is hyperbolic language, but we need to read some of these psalms with that consideration. For example, in Psalm 6, David prayed, Every night I flood my bed with tears. Not really. Okay? He cried a lot. He's using hyperbolic language. In Jeremiah 20, I like what Jeremiah says. He's got this curse, this imprecation. He's just really not happy about the ministry God has given to him. So he's not happy with the person that announced to his father that his father had a new son. Cursed be that man who told my father a son is born to you and didn't kill me in the womb. And he talks about all these things that need to happen to this man who didn't kill him in the womb. It's safe to assume Jeremiah didn't really mean that. He's using some over-the-top hyperbolic language to express his grief and his remorse. At times, the prayers for vengeance could contain some hyperbole. Number three, when the Jews were praying like this, they believed that their cause was God's cause. Just consider for a second the words in Psalm 139, verses 21 and following. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. In other words, God, if they're your enemies, they're my enemies. And then he says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. They really believed that when they were praying for vengeance, they were praying for the vindication of God's holy name. Jerusalem was the city of God, and they wanted God to vindicate himself and his people. Number four, they were regularly praying for justice. You may be familiar with what has come to be known as the principle of talion. The legal term in Latin is lex talionis, law of retribution. This is detailed, all of these retribution laws in the Code of Hammurabi, but we see them in the ancient Hebrew Scriptures. We see in the Old Testament, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. What is going on here? Is this God calling for retribution? No, it's actually a call for equity and justice. In other words, it could be read only an eye for an eye. Only a tooth for a tooth. In other words, somebody punches you and knocks your tooth out, you don't get to kill them back, okay? The only thing they get to lose is a tooth. They they probably had seen their children killed, and they are praying for just retribution. Friends, this is not uncommon to us. Let me ask you, after 9-11, how many of you saw President Bush standing on the rubble with his bullhorn saying to the terrorists, we're coming to get you, and didn't feel good about it? You sat there and said, yes, we are. You wanted justice. You wanted somebody to pay, and that is not necessarily an unholy feeling because God is a God of justice. Number five, at times, now we don't see it in Psalm 137, but at times, in fact, most of the time with the imprecatory Psalms, we also see prayer for repentance for the enemies. An example is Psalm 83. Where the psalmist, I believe believe it's Asaph there, prays, God, fill their faces with shame that they may seek your name. With the exception of Psalm 137, a common prayer for judgment leads to a prayer for repentance for the enemies. Number six, and this is really important, the Old Testament ethic is really not different than the New Testament ethic. We don't have two different gods with two different sets of standards with two different personalities. Let me read to you. You don't need to turn there, but from Romans chapter 12, this is the New Testament. Beginning in verse 17, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. 
Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink, for by doing so you'll heap burning coals on his head. Do you know that that Romans chapter 12 ethical passage is actually a quotation? The bulk of it is quotation from Proverbs 25 and Deuteronomy 32. The Old Testament ethic is derived. I mean, the New Testament ethic is derived from the Old Testament ethic and even expanded upon. Leviticus 19 says, don't take vengeance or bear a grudge. Exodus 23 says, if the animal of your enemy is astray or overburdened, you help your enemy with that. In other words, the New Testament ethic and the Old Testament ethic are God's ethic. Number seven. The New Testament also stresses the vengeance of God. There are many passages, are there not, about the final judgment of God in the New Testament? In fact, didn't Jesus talk about, warning about the final judgment in Matthew chapter 7? In Matthew chapter 25 and in other places? Not only that, but we see imprecatory words coming from God's people in the New Testament. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul is writing about these people that are insisting on circumcision for people who convert. Paul says, I wish they'd go ahead and emasculate themselves. <laughs> He's wishing for something even worse on these people. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul talks about Alexander, the coppersmith, who did him great harm. What does he say? The Lord will pay him back. And in Revelation chapter 6, this marvelous vision of the apostle John's, he sees the people, the souls of those under the altar. And what are these souls? These are the souls whose blood has been shed for their witness of Jesus. These are the martyrs. And what are the souls of the martyrs under the altar crying out to God? O oh, sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? By the way, what's the answer they're given? Not until the rest of the martyrs are killed. Be patient. So the idea of God exacting vengeance is not really a foreign idea in the New Testament, is it? Number eight, these imprecatory psalms can be prayers of the promises of God. Jeremiah 51, 56 talks about the destruction of Babylon with very similar language to Psalm 137, verse 8. In fact, there are three words that are taken right out of both of those verses that line up. And listen to these words from Isaiah 13, verse 16. As Isaiah is prophesying way in the future about the judgment that will come to Babylon. Listen to what he says. Their infants will be dashed in pieces before their eyes. Their houses will be plundered and their wives ravished. Could it be that as they sat there in all their grief being tormented by the people that had murdered their children, they were simply saying, God, you promised vengeance. Hurry. God, fulfill your promise through the prophet Isaiah and vindicate your name and vindicate your people. Every time we say, come, Lord Jesus, are we not praying for the promise that Jesus is coming back to settle the score? Number nine. We'll talk about this more in the next few weeks but these psalms, friends, are simply honest expressions of raw emotion. I think somewhere we learned in Sunday school along the way that prayer is supposed to have certain words and be all nice and pure and proper, and it's not always that way. We pour our hearts to God. Number 10. Though they prayed with bitterness and anger, they didn't necessarily stay that way. We don't know about the particular person who penned this psalm, but these psalms are descriptive of how they pray, not prescriptive of how everyone should pray all the time. This is a snapshot of a raw, difficult, grievous, painful prayer offered at a difficult time in someone's life. And what do we know about being in the dark, dark places emotionally and spiritually? We don't always stay there, do we? 
we come out to pray differently on another day. These are some principles to apply to exegeting the imprecatory psalms. But what can we learn specifically without pretending this text doesn't exist, without trying to make this text say something that it doesn't say, how can we look through the lenses of the New Testament and see what we can learn about prayer? Not, again, making this psalm something it's not. How can we today learn something about prayer from this psalm? We learn about prayer in light of three things. Number one, in light of our present circumstances. Friends, one thing we can learn from prayers like this is that we can pour our hearts out in pure, brutal honesty to God. People say to me all the time, I know I shouldn't be praying this way. Why not? If you cannot pour your heart out before God, your Father, why not? If your child has been murdered, I would expect you to grieve and even express anger and bitterness to God. In the midst of that grief and anger, let it out. Tell your father what is on your heart. He knows what's in there anyway. But we can also, in light of circumstances, pray for the powerless, the Jews sitting by the water in Babylon were completely powerless and defeated. Maybe you're not one of those powerless people, but you can pray for the vindication of powerless people. You can pray for the millions of Christians that today are being persecuted, imprisoned, tortured, even put to death around the globe. We must partner with them. We must not forget our brothers and sisters in Christ who are being persecuted and they're powerless to do anything about it. And we can pray for protection against their pers- or from their persecutors. We can pray for their safety. We can pray for their strength. We can pray for the conversion of their persecutors. And we can pray for justice in these circumstances. Friends, we can pray for the powerless. I think you, you, you probably have been reading like I have recently about one of these just dirty secrets that's been kept for so long about what's going on with the sex trade of, of young children even. You know, I read recently in one of the articles I was reading about, well, actually, I've seen this statistic come up in a few of the articles I've read. Um, I'm trusting that it's reliable based on the sources, but that the average age a woman enters the sex trade is 13. That's the average. That means that those getting their start at 16, 17, 18, 19 years old, that average is affected by those getting their start at 7, 8, 9, 10 years old. Friends, we should be crying out to God that justice will come on the wicked people who do that kind of thing. And I don't think that's unholy. And so we can pray for justice. A couple of years ago, I left my house, was headed to church. I go to church on Sunday morning about 5, and I was just, man, there were just all these police cars. I had just missed a crime by maybe 10 minutes. Tons of police cars. Both sides of the road, there's an apartment complex there. What had happened is there were a couple of cars with rival gang members, and um, one of them pulled, or a couple of guys pulled out some guns and started firing shots. Of course, they didn't hit the rival gang members, but one of the bullets went across the street and through the wall in an apartment complex and hit an eight-year-old girl named Paige in the head, killed her instantly. I was enraged. And I tell you, I prayed that somebody would squeal on those guys. I prayed that the police would find them. When I heard they were going to trial, I prayed that justice would be served. And guess what? It has, and I'm glad. I would love to see those guys get saved in jail, but they need to be in jail. Pray for justice. Prayer is frequently messy and emotional. And our messy, emotional, imperfect, grievous prayers are not always bad prayers. Further, with our New Testament lenses on, we can pray in light of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. 
which says we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We need to recognize who the enemies are. The Muslims are not our enemies. Right, Dr. Edens? Guess what? The gays are not your enemies. The atheists are not your enemies. We need to stop railing on people and start railing against who the enemy is. And it's Satan and all his wicked forces arrayed against us. We have to recognize the enemies and pray against them. Friends, we are entrenched in a spiritual battle and one of the worst things that can happen to us is for us not to realize that it is a spiritual battle because spiritual battles are not waged with bullhorns and picket signs. Spiritual battles are raised in the prayer closet on our faces before God crying out to Him day and night to push back the darkness. And ultimately, we look forward, do we not, to the final judgment. Isn't it good to know that we have something that the psalmist did not have? We have the last book of the Bible. And I love, I just love, I love reading about the rider on the white horse whose robe is drenched in blood. And the enemy and all the forces of evil are arrayed on the battlefield. Man, they're going to have this epic, epic battle of the ages. And what do we read happens? That this huge battle takes place and there's bloodshed and angst and death and destruction. No, we read that the rider on the white horse comes, scoops up all the enemies and throws them into the lake of fire. And the battle is over like that. We know that the day of justice is coming. And we long for the day. Creation groans for the day that God will set things right. And we are encouraged, even though that is a day of death and destruction, we are encouraged by John himself to pray for that day. When he says in Revelation 22, let the Spirit and the bride say, come. Come, Lord Jesus. Let us pray for the day that the final battle is won and there will be no more war and there will be no more enmity. Finally, we can pray in light of the cross. Terry and I were watching uh, something on TV the other day. A woman's son had been murdered and she felt like she knew who the murderers were and she, she made the comment, if they don't, get convicted, God will judge them. And we both responded, no, God's going to judge them anyway. Because everyone faces justice. All sins are offenses against God and will be avenged by God. And for most, we read in Scripture, it will be at that great and dreadful day at the great white throne of judgment. But friends, for us, isn't it good to know that justice has been served on the cross? The cross isn't about Jesus setting a nice example. The cross is about Jesus paying the penalty that we deserve. He took our place and justice was meted out against the perfect, beautiful Son of God on our behalf. That should inform our praying even with regard to our enemies. We should pray for the salvation of our enemies. We know that. And I'm going to tell you, if I get a call at 2 o'clock in the morning by a screaming mother asking me to come to her house and I go sit down with a man and woman whose child has just been murdered, I'm not going to say, now we need to pray for the salvation of whoever did this. I'm not going to do that. That would be really insensitive. What I need to do is encourage them to grieve and to cry out to God and to be honest with God and to pour their hearts out to God. But I know that if they are truly in Christ, that because of the cross, they can eventually move into a place where they can pray for their enemies. We need to pray for our own witness. Friends, I hope you read church history and I hope you read about what's going on around the globe right now. I find it fascinating, like we've seen this pastor being sentenced to death in Iran, that still after 2,000 years of church history, wicked dictators believe that by killing Christians, they're going to kill the church. 
Aren't you glad they still haven't gotten it? Because what happens when they start killing Christians? The church just explodes. I shared the story of the Walamo believers in Ethiopia back in the 30s and 40s with my church on Sunday. There were 48 of them with the missionaries. There were 48 believers after nine years of missionary work. And the believers got carted out by the Italian forces coming. When the Italian forces got there, as Mussolini was trying to establish the East African Empire, the Italian forces started torturing the Christians, especially the church leaders. They were putting them in prison. They were torturing them. They were beating them with, with, with whips made out of hippo hide and in five years the church grew from 48 to over 10,000 amidst that kind of persecution because there's something about people being oppressed mistreated persecuted who would rather embrace death than deny their Jesus that has a way of winning the persecutors over And friends, we can pray with gratitude that our judgment is finished. Jesus bore it all. He did everything, and that should change everything. Psalm 137 is a hard text, and I'll just share with you. It hasn't been the most fun text to preach, and you can share with me that it was not the most fun text to listen to preached. And I started with the question, why preach Psalm 137? I hope that today I've made a case for preaching 137. But I think maybe even a better question, a better question than why preach Psalm 137 is why have you listened to a sermon on Psalm 137? And the answer is not because you didn't know that's what the sermon was going to be. The answer is because God brought you here to hear this sermon today and maybe it's just because you needed to know what to do with this text and that's a very good reason because somebody's going to ask you in your ministry someday. But maybe it was to help you understand grieving people and the sometimes outrageous things that they say. They do. If you're in the ministry and you've ever been in the room with somebody who is right now just had a wound ripped open because of the loss of someone, it is sometimes shocking the things that come out of their mouths. Things that six months later they won't even have remembered saying, and if they do, they'll be embarrassed by it. Maybe this can help you understand somebody you're dealing with right now who is bitter and angry. It's easy to criticize these Jews who prayed like that until we understand them. Maybe you're here today because you need to know how to help hurting, angry, and bitter people. And maybe you even need to repent of a judgmental attitude today towards somebody that doesn't pray the way you think they ought to. And maybe... You're currently being opposed or mistreated or you have been opposed or mistreated and maybe you're angry and bitter and you've been afraid to tell God about it. A lot of people did not grow up with the kind of home life that I grew up with. I grew up with a mom and dad who literally told me they loved me numerous times a day. I grew up with this father who was tender-hearted and strong all at the same time. I broke my arm one time playing flag football in middle school. I got tackled playing flag football. Wrong. I was in the hospital at the same time that there was a major five-car accident, and I was a broken arm who got triaged to last place. My parents were not available. They had to go find them. We didn't have cell phones. My dad was in a golf tournament. My mom was driving around watching him. They finally found them. They showed up at the hospital. I was in pain. They couldn't even give me a shot until a doctor saw me. And so I hadn't had any pain medicine for four or five hours. Big, tough 13-year-old kid sitting there in pain. I'd handled it fairly well at the time. And I looked up and saw my dad standing in the doorway of the emergency room door. And my dad... And I remember it like it was yesterday. This big, tough, football-playing 13-year-old kid said, Hold me, Dad. And my big, strong, 6-foot, 4-inch, 200-pound something dad came and sat down in a chair and put me in his lap, and he held me, and he stroked my hair, and he kissed my forehead. Friends, you have a father who understands your pain and your grief, and you have a father who in the... 
in, in, in his son, who, whose son sent his son into our world to experience that pain and that grief with us and who grieves with us. And if we will go to him and pour our hearts out to him, if you're in the middle of pain and anger and bitterness right now, will you receive the embrace of the perfect father who will love you and hold you and care for you and get you through your struggles and bring you to the place where you need to be? He is good and he is kind. And I don't have the words to tell you how much he loves you. Let it out to your father. Then behold the cross. Because our goal is to move. Our goal is to move from Psalm 137 praying to Acts chapter 7 praying. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen is about to be killed. He is being stoned. He looks up. He sees the glory of God and the Son of God at his right hand. He sees the glory of God and cries out to those who are murdering him. Oh, Lord, do not hold this against them. How can he do that? He beheld the glory of God and God's Son. We want to move from Psalm 137 praying to Acts chapter 7 praying. And friends, when you're sitting there saying, I've lost my song, how can I sing in Babylon? We want to move from Psalm 137 that says, how shall we sing to Acts chapter 16 singing where Paul and Silas are in the inner prison in stocks at midnight in this dark, smelly filthy place not knowing what the daylight would bring and what are they doing at midnight they're singing praise songs to god why are they doing that because on the road to damascus paul had met the son of god face to face and he was changed forever and how could he sing in babylon how could he sing in samaria how could he sing in macedonia how could he sing in philippi and thessalonica and athens and corinth because he had met jesus the son of god we want to move from 137 in the psalms we want to move into Acts 16 singing. We have to be honest with God and let him take us from one place to another so that one day again we can sing by the river. Let's pray together. Father, I pray right now for those in this room who are hurting and bitter and angry and maybe afraid to tell you about it. Lord, would you unlock their mouths and their hearts and let them pour their souls out to you. God, from this understanding of a grieving people, would you help us be better ministers of the gospel, loving people and encouraging them and walking through the valleys of the shadow of death with them. And Lord, would you help us to be the kind of people who pray, who pray honestly, who pray freely. And would you always take us from Psalm 137 to Acts 7 and Acts 16 and let us sing, Lord. Help us to sing by the rivers in Babylon. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.